look, we're crashing. The question is, are you prepared for it? And better question is, how do you prepare for it? And how do we get through? How do you get through what's about to happen? Because it's one thing to crash, but the can, can you survive it? The problem with most people is they're stuck in microeconomy. You know, they, they, don't, they don't see the big picture. And I talked to, I, w- I would estimate 90% of Americans just believe that the, you know, don't worry, America will bounce back. You know, think it'd be happy, happy days are here again. And as a former, as a U.S. Marine, you know, we call the people who are stuck in the microeconomy, they got their heads up their asses. They can't even see what's happening in the real world. So I'm talking to a real, talk to many real estate agents here in Arizona. They say, oh, don't worry, you know, interest rates are going up and all this stuff, but don't worry, Arizona is hot. That's true because the people are migrating out of California, Chicago, New York, and now Florida, they're moving here, you know. So Arizona is good. So on the micro scale, these real estate agents are accurate. They're going, yeah, I don't have to worry, man. I live in Arizona. So that's having your head up your ass as far as I'm concerned because you can't see the macro. And when you look at the macro, the whole world is collapsing around them. And it's, it's gonna be good for Arizona maybe because people will move here and all this stuff. Well, let, let's, say, let's say that uh, China whacks Taiwan. Well, that's good for me in Hawaii because all those Taiwanese will move to either California, Arizona, or Hawaii. So that's micro and macro. So let me give you the definition of micro is you got your head up your ass. You better stand around and take a look at what's going on. Pull your head out of you, you know what. I cannot stress this more importantly, especially today, because look, we're crashing, like it or not. The question is, how will you survive it? So my friend, uh, you've been calling this for a long time. The dollar is in crisis, isn't it? Well, so our economic system is in crisis, and I'm I'm really worried now that we're on the verge of a serious economic crisis that could see the destruction of trillions of dollars of additional wealth before this thing is over. Give me a break. Are we corrupt or what? So capitalism, in my view, became corrupted at the fundamental level when we stopped backing dollars with gold. Yes. And... To make a long story, not not too complicated a story, but to make a long story short, this unleashed an explosion of credit. The credit absolutely exploded. It, total credit or total debt in the United States grew from $1 trillion when I was three years old in 1964 to $91 trillion now, from $1 to $91 trillion in my lifetime. And during that process, that created a great deal of wealth, a great deal of economic growth in the United States and all around the world. But our economy became addicted to credit growth. We must, our economy must have credit growth to stay out of crisis. And now credit is contracting when you adjust it for inflation. So this is a very serious problem for, for our economic system, which I call creditism rather than capitalism, since it's driven by credit growth. You know, micro is this, you're standing at the, you're pumping gas into your lease SUV and you're going, why is the price of oil going up? <laughs> That's micro. I mean, they can't see it. But inflation, I'm afraid, is systemic now. And a lot of it is because what Richard's talking about is creditism. They just print so much money. Instead of solving the problems, they print money. That's been the problem since about 1998 when LTCM, long-term capital management, crashed. And the Fed had to bail out a hedge fund. And Jim Records is a friend of ours. He wrote the book Currency Wars and all that. His question was back then, who bails out the Fed? And I think we're kind of there now. I mean, that's what you've been writing about in dollar crisis and the corruption of capitalism. Who's going to bail out the Bank of England? And who's going to bail out the Fed and all the other, the Bank of Japan and all these central banks? Well, the Any central banks on? have had it very easy for the last three and a half decades because right. globalization was extremely deflationary. It was pushing down prices and, and the inflation rate was very low. So interest rates were very low. So they could get away with printing a whole lot of money without causing high rates of inflation. Right. And, that, and by printing a lot of money, they would buy government bonds and that would finance government spending. Let the government spend a lot of money and stimulate the economy that way. 
So this was Goldilocks for three and a half decades. But suddenly now globalization is going at least partially into reverse. Yep. First, we had COVID in the supply chain bottlenecks all around the world. Next thing you know, Russia's invaded Ukraine, pushing up energy prices, oil prices, gas prices, wheat prices, corn prices, another big round of inflation. And suddenly the central banks are in shock because for the first time in 35 years, they have to deal with inflation. And inflation in the UK is at 10%. It's 10% in Germany. It's practically 10% in the United States. And so now if they try to support the economy by printing more money, that's going to just fan the inflationary flames. But if they don't print more money, then credit is going to contract and right. the economy is going to spiral into crisis. Most Americans have no idea what happened and they actually believe the Fed can save them. But as um, my friend Jim Record says, who's going to bail out the Fed? Who's going to bail out the Bank of England? The central bank system is under crisis also right now. And that's what Richard was alluding to 20 something years ago. And so the question is next is, What's happening in China? I mean, they have the biggest bubble in real estate ever, right? Absolutely, and, and well beyond real estate, they have excess capacity of everything on a mammoth right. scale. Um, I once was told by a Chinese professor that in his town, the, the city government had built two beautiful big new bridges. The only thing is they hadn't built the river yet. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to happen with the Japanese yen and why is North Korea firing rockets at them? Um, the, bank, the Bank of Japan, the Japanese central bank, is determined to keep their interest rates at a very low level. Even though interest rates in the United States and everywhere else, most other countries are going up very rapidly. And so if the U.S. interest rates are 3.5%, Japanese interest rates are, are only one quarter of one percent and the Bank of Japan plans to keep them there and they can do that but that means no one's going to want to hold yen because it has you can't earn any money on if the interest rates 25 basis points they want to sell their yen and buy dollars and because the dollar you can get three and a half percent interest so that means the Japanese yen is falling it's at a 20 year low and unless the Bank of Japan changes its policy, it looks like it's going to keep falling. Right. And this is the thing, I, and I'm, being, I'm, I'm fourth generation Japanese American, and I always laugh about it because the Japanese per capita have the highest savings rate of all, you know, demographically, the highest savings rate of any, any population. And that's why the Japanese aren't the smartest. You know, I mean, why would you save money when the governments are printing it? So that's why in Rich Dad Poor Dad, I put savers or losers. And now American savers are getting their butts handed to them because they're going to print even more. <laughs>